we, we spent a lot of time really exploring the problem space of like, how do you run like development tool chains in a browser? Because there, there was really not any meaningful prior art on that before, before we came around. Mm -hmm. Um, and even today, like, like we've got the most domain knowledge on this stuff, I think probably compared to anyone else on the planet, simply because it's, it's what we're the business of. And, um, so we, you know, it took us two years of that R and D to where we had this kind of aha moment where we're like, oh, it actually should be possible for us to punch in a layer lower here than at this, the higher level kind of bundler runtime level. We can actually punch in more at an OS level run node. Hello, welcome to DevTools FM. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Uh, we're really excited to have Eric Simmons on today. So Eric is the CEO of StackBlitz. Uh, have really admired StackBlitz for a long time. Y'all do some really, really cool stuff. So Eric, it's just an absolute pleasure for us to have you on. Before we start talking about your past and, and some of what you're doing at StackBlitz, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Um, big fan of, of your guys' podcast. And um, yeah, a little background on me. So I'm, I'm the co-founder and CEO of StackBlitz. Um, it's an instant web-based IDE uh, for front-end development teams. And you, you might have seen it if you've ever browsed like doc sites for uh, you know Angular or React, Material UI, things like that, where it says like run live example. Like that's uh, a lot of those use StackBlitz for those sorts of things. And I started this company with actually one of my childhood best friends. He and I have been uh, building software together for the past decade and a half. So like when we were 13, we learned how to, how to write web applications and just, we've been building stuff ever since then. So StackWitz is kind of, it's, it's, you know, the, uh, uh, we started StackWitz like six, seven years ago now, I think. And just as a side project really blew up into this, uh, you know, larger thing than it is today. But it, it, Albert and I have always kind of viewed it's, uh, it's a thing that we wish we had when we were 13 learning how to code, you know, um, not even to set up our local environments. It's such a pain. Um, but anyways, yeah, so that's kind of a, a quick background on me. Yeah. We'd like to thank Rickcast for sponsoring this week's episode. Rickcast is an app for Mac that's like Spotlight, but with superpowers. Besides just quickly opening files, URLs, or apps, it provides clipboard history, window management, uh, schedule overview, and more. Uh, it's got a clean React-based API and an extension store to distribute your own custom extensions. I've been using the Rickcast extension API to make a teal draw extension so I can quickly create and save teal draw canvases for ideation or planning. I've also used Raycast deep linking feature to create a link in my Obsidian setup to quickly open some of my teal draw boards. So with custom keyboard shortcuts, an extension store, deep links, quick links, all of the features they provide, it's a really flexible tool that's indispensable in my workflow. Raycast also has a Teams feature where you can share extensions, snippets, and quick links with your teammates. You should also check out Raycast Pro. With Pro, you can take advantage of Raycast AI to summarize text in any app and translate text on the fly. It also gives you access to their cloud sync features to keep your settings synchronized across Macs. To learn more, you can visit Raycast.com or check out episode 38 where we talked to Thomas, the CEO, about Raycast and how they built it. Before, before we get into the stack blitz stuff, the the way I was alerted to your existence was you were trending on Twitter because of kind of a crazy event in your past. So uh, why were you at AOL for so long? <laughs> yeah. So for, for those um, who I imagine a lot of people may not have heard the story, but so back like 10 years ago, this is like, I think in 2012, um, there was this kind of uh, headline that was like going around the world on, you know, front page of newspapers and whatever have you about this, this, you know, teenager that, that illegally like lived in AOL's headquarters, bootstrapping a startup. And that, that guy was me. <laughs> so I was, I was, I think I was like 19 <laughs> at the time. And uh, so I, I guess there's a little bit of a callback here. So like I'd mentioned, you know, my, my co-founder Albert and I, like we had met, um, you know, when we were, you know, 13, learn how to code together. And right out of high school, um, he and I decided to, to go and do startups. And, and we grew up in, in the suburb of Chicago. And uh, at least back then, there was really nothing as far as software and startups in Chicago, um, at least nothing like the Bay Area. So we, we, were, we were pretty dead set on coming out here, but we, uh, you know, we were like broke, uh, you know, 18 year olds. And um, the reason we ended up at AOL actually was because we went through uh, this program called Imagine K-12, which was... Uh, a Y Combinator offshoot for K-12 education companies. So Albert and I were working on this like K-12 
software collaboration platform. And I think Imagine Code 12 has actually been pulled back into Y Combinator itself now. But anyways, they were actually renting office space out of AOL because at that time, AOL was like trying to reinvigorate the company um, and kind of turn things around. And so they wanted to get like entrepreneurial people and like, you know, uh, really great software people just in the same offices as their employees to, to you know, kind of have this kind of cross pollination. And um, so I ended up with an access card to AOL as a result of that um, because our incubator was was kind of based out of there. And you could use that to get it at any time of the day or night. Um, their offices were pretty sweet uh, as you know, as an 18 year old and you know, quality of living bar uh, pretty much non-existent. Uh, you know, they have tons of couches. They had a gym, which had showers and a laundromat. Like there was like, you know, food that you could eat and stuff. So, I mean, I, I think that, um, it's been a long time now, but I mean, I'm pretty sure, I think, I think that the, the, I lived on a dollar a month when I was there and I ended up being there for, I think like four <laughs> months or something like that. It was just like ridiculous. And, um, so anyway, so, so that was that. And, and I ended up bootstrapping that, you know, kind of bootstrapping our way through that period. And then we were able to raise like a little bit of money and, and you know, continue our company. But anyways, that, that, the, the, the story kind of broke and it was like this global headline, et cetera. But yeah, it was, that's like um, these days I've, I've, you know, back then it was like, that was the only thing I was known for. And today it's like, it's kind of funny because people are like, oh, I've heard of Stack Blitz. I didn't know you were that guy from 10 years ago. It's like, yeah, it's, it's not something I'm trying to advertise, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of it's kind of fun. Like that's that's not what I wanted my tombstone. I was like, this is the the kid that lived at AOL, blah blah blah. You know? so, um, anyways, yeah, so it's kind of fun story. Yeah, it's a uh, it's fun when you are like part of tech history memes. Like uh, at the old company I worked at, into it, one of the VPs was Brent Rambo, the kid who does this like the thumbs up at a computer and just like, I, I would love to have that as a part of my history. Uh, <laughs> when did it start to break down? Like, when did people notice, like, who, who is this kid? Like, what, what team does he work on? Why is he here? You know, I don't know. And then, cause it, you know, I got away with it for so long because, um, you know, they had like two or three different shifts of guards. And so like the, the, the morning folks were like, you know, just seeing me there grinding, like, you know, this, this, this guy works hard. And then the evening people were like, you know, wow, this guy looks hard. He you know, works hard. The overnight people were like, wow, this guy really works hard. But so it, it took, it took a while for, I think for the dots to connect They're like, do you see this guy a lot, you know, around here? I still don't know exactly what happened with that. Like how exactly they, they kind of lasered him, but it, it was pretty clear. Like the day that they kicked me out, it was like, I'd been like coding until two or three in the morning. And cause at that time I, I was literally just, you know, um, writing like, you know, 16 hours a day worth of code or just something like ridiculous, if, if not more. I, I wish, I, I don't know where I had the energy. It's like, now I'm like 32. I'm like, I, I, there's no way I could do that at this point. But back then just infinite energy as an 18 or 19 year old. And, um, but I, I've been coding to like three, three or four in the morning or something like that. And, um, I heard, I was like in this room with like a couch in it. And, um, I heard these footsteps just coming down the hallway and it was like, it just came straight. Like, cause there's no one in the office. Like the, it echoed through the entire floor and it just came, this guy came straight to the room I was in and opened the door and just started yelling at me and then like threw me out of the building. And so it was pretty clear that like he knew I was in there. Like it's, it, I don't know, I don't know how it came to be, but like he, he, he knew exactly where to go to find me and uh, came in and just threw me out. Um, but, um, but yeah, anyway, so. <laughs> I don't know. It's still a mystery to me to this day. Yeah. I'd love to hear the other side of that story. I can literally imagine like a, uh, um, a Seth Rogen style movie where you have like a Paul Blart mall cop type. He gets this like intuition that something's going on in the building. <laughs> I, I, I can see the movie now. Uh, you should option off the rights. I, I think you got something there. No, well, it, it was, it was pretty. So I think it was, it was, you know, the, the security team was not happy about it, obviously. Cause I think it just, it, you know, probably it didn't look maybe good on them or something like that, even though it was like, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I don't think there was a lot of fault on, on there, <laughs> but, but the executive team of AOL was legendary because the way that they were, because I mean, at that time when the, when the story broke, there were, there was some concern around the legality of, of what had happened and like, you know, the, the, everything from like, are they going to, you know, press charges on trespassing or something? Or are they going to like, you know, try and claim IP ownership of the code you were writing. They're like all the, there's all these questions that came up. Right. And, um, and, and but they were actually just in, in like the response was, uh, incredible. Like I, the, the quote is when some, like what they gave to the press, the quote that they ran with for the story was, you know, we, 
our intention was always to like facilitate entrepreneurship at our Palo Alto office. We just never expected <laughs> it to work so well. <laughs> <laughs> just like such a like such a great response, you know, from um from from the the the, you know, the marketing and the PR team there, um and and it was it was like a bullet dodge, uh you know, for me at that time. But uh, but yeah, they they were actually pretty cool. I actually ended up meeting the like a, within a week of that, they called me into the office, and I met the guy who actually provided the quote. Uh, I think his name's David Temkin, and he um super nice guy. I think he's running uh, mail or something at, at AOL at that time. But, um, you know, I, I, I sat down with him and he, he was like very, you know, he's like, I, you know, you've got, uh, you know, you've got Moxie, like, sounds like you're doing good stuff. Um, <laughs> but you know, don't, don't do this again. Like, don't, don't, don't come back, <laughs> <laughs> but they're super nice to the degree that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, we all left on good terms or whatever. That's, that's such a wild story. So I, I'm also curious about like what you were working on during time. Like, how did that product go? Like, did you have investors? Were there like people that you're, you're like at AOL like during the day and like at night, and then you like go meet your investors somewhere? Or, like, or are they asking about your living conditions? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just so fascinated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's 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 um at that time we had, we had only like gotten like back then it was the original kind of YC deal where they gave you like 20 K and you, you know, and you, you burned through that in like three or four months, right. Which we did. And, and that's, that's how I ended up at AOL is that I was like, dang, we need some more time. And so the, the, the software, we were pretty passionate about the education space. And so at that time we were working on this thing called class connect that basically was like, it's like get up for teachers where effectively like every teacher was like writing their own lesson plans and they just, and no one was sharing this stuff. And it just made, it makes no sense even to this day. Right. And so we, we ended up <clears throat> kind of creating this thing that, that solved that problem. And, um, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, as we were going through the program and when, when you go through the, one of these incubators, I mean, it, it just in investments in general, you're, you're a number on a spreadsheet typically. I mean, like they're going to not saying that, th yeah. that they don't provide you with great high quality advice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's really kind of like, you know, they're, it's, it's, it's very unusual, I guess, to have people that are really, really staying on top of like, Hey, is, does Eric have a home, you know, to that degree, right? Like that's, you know, I don't know. No one was really, they were just, they were like, he's, he's, he's somehow around, I guess, you know, he's, he's kind of giving updates and whatever, you know, but, um, but yeah, so that, that product was actually, if you want to like get brutalized in entrepreneurship, you go and start a K-12 company, anything in K-12. It's like, it is the absolute worst market. And, and people had told me this going into it, but I was like 18 and just, you know, extremely naive and whatever. And um, so basically like just, where we decided to stop going after K-12 was, um, you know, we needed to generate revenue. And so that, that means like selling to schools and that sort of thing. Right. I mean, we had a lot of teachers that were like pretty, um, you know, avid users of our platform or whatever have you. But, um, you know, if you're going to do sales, you it's kind of K-12 sales, looks very similar to enterprise sales, except way more insane, <laughs> like, and way more expensive for the reasons that, that that'll be obvious after I tell like this, this quick story. But basically we got one of the top uh, sales guys for Blackboard, which is, I, I believe like a public company, one of the biggest K-12 or, you know, et cetera, software things. And you might have used it if you ever, you know, in high school or college or something like that. Terrible software. It's ugly. Just worst software ever <laughs> they have they have the most a well-oiled sales machine like that is blackboard is a sales company not a software company and the so we were going to poach one of the top sales guys there and he's like and we're like okay how does this what would this like look like you know um to do this and he's like great so we're gonna have to out party blackboard and we're like okay i mean what does that mean like what does that mean like how, what does it mean to out party them? he's like okay well the way that Blackboard does sales every year is they invite, and this is like kind of a direct quote. It's so like, the, I'm going to use the exact phrasing that this guy said to us at that time. He said, you know, every year Blackboard invites all of the top superintendents across the, the country and to an aircraft carrier that we rent from the U.S. Navy. And we throw a giant party with booze and babes over a weekend these superintendents come with a blank check and they leave without a check. And that's how these schools decide to use Blackboard every year. And we were like, what? 
<laughs> like that's you know our our software is better. Like you know that's they should you know it's like it's more cost effective, right? Like that's yeah. this is like it's better for the kids. It's better for the teachers. You know, it just it didn't matter. It doesn't. It, it does not matter, right? So if you ever wonder why like you know your school software like sucks, it's like it, it, you know it, as with many things in, in many types of systems in life, it's like the further the 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 the, per, the person making the, the actual purchasing decision is from the person actually like using the thing that's being purchased the experience of that thing is going it tends to be worse how, proportionally to the number of layers between you and the and the purchase maker right and in k12 it yeah. is a lot of freaking layers right so um so anyway so that's we were like all right k12 it ain't it like how what do we do here and so this actually kind of ties into how we started stacklets because we ended up pivoting into uh developer education because this is back in 2012 2013 so this is angular js uh was coming on the scene this is like a year before two before react kind of started becoming a thing and uh so we ended up creating this like it was it to start it was just like a blog it called thinkster.io um and we ended up having like the tutorial on angular js um and all things angular and then we ended up we added react as well and so we were running that from 20 12 or 2013 through uh, 2017, 18, I think. And it, it became rather popular, had a couple hundred thousand people using it. And, and we are kind of similar model to like Ega.io or like Linda or Pluralsight where you come, like we, we had a whole bunch of free content, but then you could also pay a monthly subscription to access, you know, all of this content on, you know, building basically the cutting edge of web applications. Um, and the biggest problem we started running into was that at, during that transition, <clears throat> Uh, back in the you know mid 20 uh, 2010s of going from like you know when when it was angular js you were just putting like script tags and stuff but then things started shifting where you needed to use a, a build tool like webpack and etc cetera, etc cetera. and the problem is that if you're going to teach that stuff you can't use codepen anymore because codepen is just an html file a javascript file and a css file that's it like you, you can't, there's no NPM, there's no whatever, right? Maybe, maybe they've kind of added some stuff now, but even now it's like, you, you really can't do a lot of the things that you need to do. And um, that it kind of hit us. We were like, oh, you know, if we want to have these live examples, like it should be possible to actually run like a little mini version of Webpack and a little mini version of NPM in a browser tab, like not running on some server, right? Because like all these cloud IDs in the past, it's like, Every person that comes, like if you open a Cloud9 or GitHub Code Spaces link, it's your browser's not really doing anything. It, it, you have it has to go and provision a VM in the cloud. And usually that means putting in a credit card or it's like super slow or like, you know, if it's free, usually they give you like 128 megs of RAM, which they can't really do much with. Um, we we're like, it would be very interesting if you could actually just run it in the browser tab though, using the user CPU and memory, because there's no cost on our side of it. It'd be super fast, et cetera. And, and so we looked around, no one had done this. And um, Albert and I have always been suckers for a good challenge. And we spent six months building the first prototype and we launched it. And, and it kind of from day one took off like a rocket. Um, and so that, that, was, that was actually the impetus of Stackblitz kind of in this, this long story here is uh, we, we built it because people, are, you know, people on Thinkster were, were just couldn't even learn React because they're like, hey, my React says I'm out of file watchers. We're like, that's like not a React thing, you know? <laughs> um, and, um, and then, and, and anyway, so that's, that's kind of the, the, the origin of, of where Stackbots came from. And so to kind of wrap that part of the story is, you know, Stackbots started growing really quickly and Albert and I were like, oh crap, like we're, we ended up running two companies at the same time. It was just him and I, you know, like things are this thing we had bootstrapped and Stackbots this thing that we were, you know, bootstrapping as well. And uh, so we ended up selling Thinkster off so that we could focus on Stackbots full time. And that's, that's kind of where we've been, you know, since, uh, 2018. So anyways, that's kind of the. A long story long <laughs> about this kid. <laughs> no, that's a, an interesting journey. Uh, so I know like today we have like web containers and like, we'll get to that. And those are cool, interesting technology. But like in the, the time frame you described, set, like sounds like it was before web containers. So did that initial version of Stack Blitz like do something else to get all that stuff running in browser? Yeah, it did. And and because and, and we, we, we hadn't... Um, it was could be kind of punched in at a higher level than because web container punches in at a really at the almost the operating system level um, to run this stuff in the browser. So like when you go to stack what's today, you can mm -hmm. actually like run commands in a terminal and like run get the get CLI and like you know type node and you know actually get into the node wrapper or install npm package. So you had like a full programmable CLI, whereas but we the first version of Stackblitz was really just like a very hacked up version of 
like it, to be very specific, we took system JS, which was like an in-browser, uh, you know, bundler runtime thing. And we hacked it basically to, to work with webpack loaders, kinda. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we basically did to get NPM working. We wrote a whole bunch of things that it was kind of similar to like unpackage, but we basically kind of bolted it into the system JS slash, you know, webpack loader bundler thing. It was just basically this, this like custom welded thing that just allowed you to emulate, uh, how create react app or the angular CLI or these things would work, but it wasn't them. Like it was not create react app or the angular CLI or these things under the hood. It just mimicked the exact heuristics of how those things would work, which it was very fast because it's custom welded. It was an extremely fast solution, um, like from a performance perspective. But the problem that we were running into was that people were often trying to do these like advanced things where they're trying to like eject out of create react app or like they're trying to use some loader that we didn't have supported. And, um, and then also there's this trend that, that is, you know, even more in full swing now towards kind of full stack SSR, SSG sort of stuff, right? Like Next.js or Astro or whatever. And, and that's kind of where, you know, we had learned a ton. So for the, from 2017, we launched, through 2019. So like, I guess like two years, you know, we, we spent a lot of time really exploring the problem space of like, how do you run like development tool chains in a browser? Because there, there was really not any meaningful prior art on that before, before we came around. Mm -hmm. um, and even today, like, like we've got the most domain knowledge on this stuff, I think probably compared to anyone else on the planet, simply because it's, it's what we're the business of. And, um, so we, you know, it took us two years of that R and D to where we had this kind of aha moment. Where we're like, oh, it actually should be possible for us to punch in a layer lower here than at this the higher level kind of bundler runtime level. We can actually punch in more at an OS level, run Node.js on top of that, and you just run native package managers on top. Run your native tool chains on top of that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, it, it was. It, it, it were, we had a lot of conviction in that because it was actually a story we had seen happen before. Like back when we were in, in the, you know, first came to the Valley back 2012, 2013, um, we, we had ran into uh, Dylan Field, one of the co-founders of Figma. And, and that was kind of <clears throat> effectively their thesis back then was like, you know, the, the demo they went and raised some money on, the initial money was like, they had a WebGL demo with like a ball falling into water. Like it was, it was not a design tool. It was like, here's a demo that WebGL and WebAssembly is a pretty big deal. Right, right at that time, it was like ASMJS or whatever. Like, this is here's a demo of why this is a pretty big deal, why it can be used to build a design tool, like why this is going to allow design to come to the browser at what it has never been able to do so before. Give us money to go do R and D for a year or two on this technology so we can ship this thing. And that's and so that's really where where Figma started was this this deep technology bet on uh, WebGL and WebAssembly. Once they really perfected that technology, they actually added the productivity collaboration aspects kind of around the ability to do rendering like that in, in a browser engine. And that's kind of what we saw with, with web container. We were like, Oh shiz. Like this is, this is the first time really almost like the first millisecond of time where you could actually even begin kind of talking about building something like that realistically, just because of the advent of very specific browser APIs that hadn't been there before. Um, and so, so we ended up taking, you know, 2019, uh, we brought on Dominic Elm um, and uh, he was the first, uh, the first hire to work on web container. He, and he was, he, he built that project and, you know, really founded that thing and then ended up hiring on a couple other folks. Um, and then through 2021, which is when we launched it publicly. And, um, and since then it's been in, like publicly available, people are using it, et cetera. But um, anyways, yes, yeah, so that's kind of like the, the evolutionary story of kind of of how uh, how web container came to be and kind of really I mean in a sense the existential bet um, of that Stackblitz made uh, you know as a company that that it had ended up panning out and I mean that story is continuing to unfold. Yeah, the the previous strategy must have been a whole lot of work and there's like obviously a ceiling there of complexity that you're going to hit where it's like well it's just like there's a lot of things you can do we can't really support all of those but. Uh, like with web containers, were you basically able to go, okay, just kind of delete all that. And it's just web containers now. Yeah. And that's exactly it. And, and it, it was like, it was extremely unclear if it would work too. Right. So like, it, it was like, cause it was very clear to us if we, if we couldn't make web container work there, what we felt was really compelling and really interesting here. Um, you know, 
about what we were doing versus kind of what everyone else has ever done in the cloud or web IDE sort of space. Um, it, it had to work for this to make sense, to be a business, a, a meaningful, like to be a startup, like something that had high growth potential and could like actually change how we do things, right? And um, you know, back when we first raised our seed around 2019, um, we had I mean, extremely smart people that work on browser engines that were like, I don't think that I get it. I don't know if you're going to be able to do it. <laughs> and um, and, and it, just because it was, I mean, it was, it's one of these things where you can, you can kind of look at a mountain from afar and like analyze it and kind of get the right gear they think you're going to need to, you know, to climb it. And, but ultimately it's like the question of can, can you climb it? You only, you only get to know the real answer by, by, you know, strapping on and, and doing it one way or the other. And so that's kind of, that's kind of where we ended up um, with web containers. Like we just, we just, you know, we just, uh, you kind of got to a point where we had extremely high conviction, um, you know, raised some money from investors that were, that took a, you know, a pretty, uh, yeah, a pretty non-consensus bet, I would say on, on you know, certainly at that time on what we were up to, um, ended up panning out. Um, I completely forgot the question you asked me though. I, I went on a tangent to <laughs> add some color and now I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. Uh, I resonate with your words. I work at a company called Descript and we're making a very similar bet on web codex. Like we are like at the forefront of that technology and like literally like awaiting releases from Apple. So it's a, it's a fun space to be in. Uh, one thing I wanted to note before we move on to more questions is uh, I, when I would looked at your guys' pricing page, I was like kind of surprised. It feels like very low to me. And uh, I think that low price comes from like the local nature of the product, right? Yeah, effectively. I mean, I, th I think, um, yeah, th that's, that's one of the, like the, the great things about our model is, is that, um, you know, we don't have to charge you by the minute and we're able to leverage your local hardware. So like we, we can charge us more like a SaaS subscription for that, that you would, that you would expect from, I don't know, like something like, like Figma or something like that, right? Like our Google docs, so you can kind of, you, it, the cost model is, is the same, you know, so we can actually kind of leverage that. Um, to, to give a very transparent, like, uh, pricing model, like one, one of the things that, um, you know, from a marketing side that we've been kind of kicking around is like, it, you kind of think of it like when you're buying a Stackblitz subscription, you're buying, you know, unlimited compute minutes effectively. Right. Whereas, you know, when, when you kind of look at these other things, it's like, they give you, you know, you're either getting like buying like, you know, 50 bucks worth of X number of minutes, or it's, you're paying by the minute. And it's just, um, it doesn't make sense either because this is one of the things too that we we you know again a couple of years ago back in twenty I mean even even until 2020, 2021, there was not a lot of belief that Moore's law was going to keep up because um, like x eighty six architectures were just kind of struggling and so a lot of I I don't think it's I don't think it's controversial to say that the consensus take at that time was that workloads were going to need to move to the cloud and you you saw this with things like Mighty and Stadia and blah, 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 where they kind of gave up on your end device compute becoming faster in any meaningful way. And they're like, okay, everything's going to have to go to the cloud and be rendered there, even like your browser and gaming and whatever. And, but what happened is, I mean, Apple, uh, I think single-handedly kind of proved like, nope, like we can ship ridiculously fast stuff, you know, to end clients. And that's, that's, you know, and it's smoking the stuff that's sitting in data centers today. So, so there's kind of this interesting situation going on where like you buy a MacBook, right? And it's got you know, state of the art ARM based chipsets that's way faster than what's going to be in, you know, you connect, connect to an AWS or whatever uh, for the same price point at least. And um, so if you're, if you're like a company, it's like, wait, we're, we're buying a $2,000 MacBook. That's crazy fast. Why, why are we going to pay by the minute for like yeah, x86 things that are slower, <laughs> you know? Than what you can get on local. So, so I think I think there's kind of this transition back to okay, wait a second, like client side, client side that is actually, uh, you know, that that the the, the consensus view that that you know client side compute is going to go away is it seems to be reversing at least in in the kind of immediate term. But I mean, I think it, it's it's incredible. I mean, the the, the yearly releases Apple's doing in particular, that just the they, where does it end? You know, like how, how much more, how many more years are we going to see of that? You know? So I, I think, it, I think the answer is like uh, quite a few more. It's, I, I don't think this is a temporary uh, state of affairs we're in. So anyways, blah, blah, blah. But like, that's, you know, I think that was a, another important part here of like um, something that's actually changing right now. Like this is, this has now become like the consensus view, but like for us, this is like the, this is kind of what we 
had felt, you know, was, was likely to, to be the case back four or five years ago. It's likely that you also benefit from the fact that like a lot of customers using stack blitz are probably developers or like, you know, have beefier machines likely. Uh, I mean, just giving a tech project product, even if it's like educational in nature or, you know, sort of can facilitate that use case. I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're, you kind of benefit from some better client support there. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about is just like feature coverage a little bit. So I had contributed to code sandbox back in the day. Um, it's been a while, but I think I, I like added like pug support or something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but, uh, I remember interest. The interesting thing about code sandbox is it was probably like somewhat similar to your pre, uh, pre web container model. And that like, they just had loaders running in web workers and that was sort of like, they just distributed a bunch of stuff in web workers. And, you know, you just, you had to write a lot of manual glue code and like rewrite a lot of loaders and do this stuff. So it like supported the language. Uh, so it was never as simple as just like, Oh, this new thing came out and now we support it. Uh, Cause like, as you know, <laughs> the front end world in particular moves so daggum fast that there's like always something new coming out like always a new compile to language or, you know, build tooling or whatever else. So I'm curious in the new world where you're using web containers is the, the sort of notion of language support. Is that even something that you're really thinking of like as a first class thing, or do you just like, does that just come by the nature of just like having web containers or like how much extra work do you have to do in that? Yeah. Great question. And so, so, um, specifically like <clears throat> language support for us is largely a, a, uh, a question of like, are how well do these languages like the compilers or runtimes of these languages compile to web assembly. Right. And, and so the answer for that just continues to get better year over year. So like back when we were, you know, back two years ago, the answer was not a lot. <laughs> um, today, the answer is like, we've got the first ecosystems coming online now. Um, for other languages. So uh, one, you know, probably the, 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 the most fully featured example of this would be PHP and WordPress. And, uh, like when we first saw WordPress come online, we were like, WordPress like that, you know, what, you know, but, but <laughs> it's, um, it, you know, WordPress, WordPress powers, I think, you know, like 40% of the internet or something. It's just kind of, a, it, it's ridiculous. Like, it, it, you know, and, and it's been around for, you know, what, like uh, two, de two decades, something like that, you know, like 15, 20 years or something. So this is not like a greenfield thing. Like this is something with a lot of history and uh, backwards compatibility, et cetera. And they've got their entire thing running in, you know, in WebAssembly and StackBlitz web containers now. And, um, and that's huge because now with like people that are building WordPress plugins and sites or whatever have you, I mean, like you can do that whole thing in Stackbooks, right? Um, another, you know, the, a couple of, uh, uh, like a month ago, um, we announced uh, uh, support for the WebAssembly system interface, which is effectively uh, allows native languages to you know, have the system interfaces you need to run, like file system access, networking, et cetera. Um, and so we've actually got like early previews of like Python and some other things running in stack blitz. And so I think that like, you know, you fast forward, you know, two, three, four, five years. Um, I think, you know, I, most of the world software I think is going to be compiling the web assembly natively just because, uh, I mean, the performance continues to get better. The compatibility thing is huge where it's just not having to have all these different build targets and stuff. Um, you know, so, anyway, so the, the, that's, that's like the, you know, in a nutshell, um, you know, the, our bet on web assembly uh, is kind of is the enabler of these other things starting to you know come online and kind of fit into this crazy new world, so to speak. So for like you to fit these like new languages and other tools into a web container, is it like first required to go to web assembly so it can run in a web container? I, I'm not really sure on how like those two technologies mix. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So basically, um, and so this is the nice thing about the WebAssembly system interface is like is like a you know standardized thing through the the bytecode alliance, which we're a part of, but um it's 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 not it's like an open specification. So like there's a lot of tools like you can run WASI stuff in a Cloudflare worker or on like your local machine or in Stack Blitz. And um and so the only requirement is basically you just have a you know a dot WASM file that exposes the WASI interface to the host to actually kind of plug in and, and run. 
Um, and so really the, as a language, if I like, let's say I'm, you know, we're like, we want to have Rust work, you know, the Rust compiler work in Stack Notes, right? But really the only question is like, can we get the Rust compiler compiled to a WebAssembly binary that uses the WebAssembly system interface to, you know, do its thing? Um, mm. In some cases that's, that's today can be uh, easier said than done. And it really depends a lot on the nature of the language and how that compiler works, the runtime if it works. Um, so there's like specific stuff like uh, the WebAssembly garbage collection proposal. I think that stuff's actually in Chrome behind the feature flag, or maybe it's even been unflagged. I can't remember. Um, there's like multiple memories, which is pretty important for things that are you know more uh, sophisticated. But so, so there's kind of these like proposals in the WebAssembly world that are going to be pretty important to get a lot of these language compilers and runtimes to be able to work properly. But, um, but this is kind of the nature of the web. Like, I think it's just the, 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 the thing with like, the thing with browser APIs, like browser technology is that um, it's, it's something where you, you have to, the security is actually the number one thing that has to be right from day one. And that usually, usually the trade-off here is like something that's going to be more secure is going to have uh, robustness and performance degradations as a result, right? And so it, it, but if you give it enough time, those things actually get resolved where you actually end up with this you know, kind of secure by default design that actually runs at native speeds. And this is what we've seen with JavaScript engines. You know, if you kind of rewind back to the 2000s um, when JavaScript was first invented, I mean, it really took 10 years, 15 years for, for you know, V8 to absolutely slam through the, the you know, the majority of the wins performance wise you can do to make JavaScript ridiculously fast. We're, we're maybe halfway, two thirds away through the story on WebAssembly, I'd say. So I, I think it's, I, I, I would not be surprised to see you know, by the end of the decade, like the, 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 any, any performance or robustness issues with WebAssembly effectively being gone at that point. Um, and adoption, I think you know, is, is, is going to, you know, even even with those things, it's like more and more things are, are going to be able to compile. And it's really more of a question, how do you get 100% coverage of all the languages out there? That's more of like a by 2030 thing. But I think every year throughout, it just, it continues to grow. Yeah, there, there really seems to be a groundswell of support behind the technology. Like uh, the web is special because it's like, it's the one place where everybody has to go no matter their language and put a website site up. And I think that's why like Wasm has the same kind of like excitement behind it. Cause it's like, oh, we're really now welcoming all of those other communities in like a first class way, even though it might not be the fastest right now, we can work towards that. Totally, totally. And, and, and yeah, and it's, it's also like, like a very, like running an entire compiler or like runtime is a pretty heavy duty use case. Like, like that, um, there was a guy I had talked to a long time ago. I can't remember um, who that was, but um, he, he had said like, uh, you know, a good a measure of like how powerful a platform is, there's really two types of applications that uh, that are the most intensive to run for any type of platform. One is video games, simply because the number of, you know, CPU cycles and then computation that's happening there is, is just incredible, right? The other one is IDEs, because it's not like it's, it's, if you're running a compiled application, that's kind of one thing, right? But then when you're actually running an entire environment that's running all of these tools that are being used to develop an application that is going to be compiled, it's actually, you know, an order of magnitude harder and like and more computation intensive typically uh, to actually do that. And, um, and so I think in the case of WebAssembly today, it's like, you know, if you can write like you know, our, our web, uh, web container stuff is written with, uh, you know, is written with Rust compiled to WebAssembly and it's like crazy fast, extremely optimized, right? But like that, the 10x harder problem there is like making the, the Rust compiler, you know, work at that same sort of crazy speed or whatever as a WebAssembly file, right? But it's but it's a challenge worth doing for the same reason that, you know, like going to the moon yielded uh, just, a, you know, a crop of technologies that, that, you know, changed everything just for everyday, you know, humans like duct tape. What a, what a fantastic invention. We needed it to 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 land people on the moon, right? So, um, so I, I think it's like in, in kind of the browser world, the browser technology world, it's like these sorts of, um, you know, these sorts of like crazy stress tests are are really are really important actually for us to kind of aim towards and, and make sure they're running well because it's 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 the rising tide that lifts all boats, so to speak. 
I'm curious about what the support story was for just like getting node running. Cause I mean, that was a huge accomplishment in itself. And I, I'm not, it wasn't clear to me like how much of that was like the community was working towards, you know, the features and functionality like, like gave you the leverage to, you know, connect the dots or if it was like, y'all had to invest a lot of like R and D time into like making that happen. So could you tell us a little bit more about like, you know, how you got to that point? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, yeah, it, it was, um, I mean, the, the, the Node.js core contributors are like incredible. I mean, like Node.js in general is like a, a, an amazing project. Um, making it work in a browser was, was largely, um, I was largely left on our end. Cause, cause you know, for us, um, you know, we were, we, we've been very focused on like front end development kind of as the main, the main starting use case. And so obviously Node is the primary tool that's, you know, used to run these tool chains or whatever have you. So it was like, that was the ecosystem that we, that we had really lasered in on. And, um, it, it was, it was extremely hard. Uh, I mean that, that it, the bulk of our work was just figuring out how to like, how to make st- like na- the native parts of node, you know, work in a browser, whether via WASAB or JavaScript. And, um, yeah, that it, it was, it was, um, so, you know, our, our folks, uh, like Dom and then the other folks that worked on the web container stuff, um, you know, our, I mean, just extremely familiar with pretty much every part of Node.js. And like, and we've ended up upstreaming, you know, a handful of different things to Node over the years as a result. But, um, but yeah, like that, that is, that was and continues to be actually one of the biggest, you know, uh, parts of our work today on Web Container. Yeah. What, one really cool feature you guys have there is that you can just pop a debugger statement in a Node program and it pauses the browser debugger without any other setup that... The DX there is just amazing. Like I, I personally never debug my node applications because I, ne- I don't want to go look up how to do it. I'm just console log. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, and that was like, and it's funny too, because we didn't really realize that that was going to be one of the like magical, you know, side effects of this thing. Cause you know, like, but it was actually, as we were building web it kind of started to work. Um, you know, just, we, we kept running, you know, the, you know, the earlier builds of this stuff, you can imagine a lot of stuff was breaking. And, um, and so we we're like running these different, you know, tool chains with those next JS or whatever, and something would break and, um, and we put a debugger there and we're like, oh, right. Like this, because you're running the back end in the front end, <laughs> essentially you, you, you can put a debugger, whether it's, you know, it, it's kind of cool because you, you can actually have debuggers that are running both in your running web application, but also that in your node application, and you're actually stepping through them linearly, right. In Chrome dev tools. Um, which is really an experience that like, maybe there's, maybe there is something on local that kind of lets you do that, but like, it's the way it, I mean, you know, having that just where you're already going to do debugging in Chrome dev tools and like having it just, just work across the board is pretty magical. Um, it's so that, you know, it, that was kind of a funny one because it, it was just, I don't think it was really on any of our radars, how amazing of a feature that was until we actually went to launch the thing. We we're like, this is like one of the best features ever. Cause we, we had been using it the whole development time basically we're like, this is crazy. Like this is, you know, as you're having to build full stack apps, um, having full stack debugging is, uh, you know, is key. Um, but yeah, that's, that is a very valuable, very interesting one. Where have you seen uh stack blitz get the most success? Where's the, the product really found its home? Good question. Yeah. I think, um, so, for like individual developers, I mean, in the open source realm, it's had a lot of a lot of pickup in uh, documentation or for you know libraries. Often, it's you know the, the pain of being like a, a design system or like library maintainer, uh, one that's used by a lot of people, especially, is that you get all these bug reports, and often they don't provide a reproducible example. And if they, if they did give, do give you one, it's like in a GitHub repo, which means you have to like clone that thing down and you have to install the dependencies. Like it's just a whole process, right? So often people are like, hey, provide a stack blitz link with every reproduction. And that and it just cuts down the amount of time to actually review bugs. Because a lot of times people will file a bug. It's like not actually a bug. They're just like confused. And it's like, oh, I click this thing. Okay, you're just confused. Here's a, another stack blitz like showing you how it works, right? Um, so that's a pretty popular one. And um, so we ended up kind of, uh, building, we didn't really realize what, how, you know, what we were building that, you know, at the time, but like stack is a very classic, uh, product led growth sort of motion. Like that's kind of the term or community driven sales funnel, but basically like, you know, a lot of, you know, two and a half, three million developers a month use stackless.com and, uh, and they find us through open source stuff or they're prototyping their own applications. And then out of those folks, they're just using it for their own personal purposes or whatever. 
um, we'll have people just raising their hand going, hey, I could use this at my company, right? And um, where we've actually found the the most success has been in the Fortune 500, like companies that are pretty you know security conscious and um, et cetera, because the, the compute model that Stackblitz uses is like I was saying before about browsers, right? They have to be extremely secure. So when you open a, a, any arbitrary, uh, you know, web page, you're downloading third-party code and executing it on your local machine. Um, and so, for that reason, browsers have some arguably the best sandboxing technology available in the world. Certainly, the the, the most well-tested. And uh, so, what, when you go and look at enterprise companies. Security matters a lot because of supply chain attacks, because of you know nation states that are you know, trying to attack uh, Western infrastructure, and this is actually a huge a huge upgrade because uh, when you open a Stackblitz link, even if it has some exploit in it, it can't you know root out and you know break out of the browser security sandbox. Like this is actually a much better security model than running stuff in your own local machine, and um, but it also gives you all the productivity benefits. Uh, you know, that a, a web-based thing would like, you know, the same sort of benefits that Figma or Google Docs like does to, you know, supercharge collaboration. So it's kind of a unique point in time where like, because this browser technology has matured so much over the past decade or two, you actually have like way better productivity as a result, um, but also way better security. So for that reason, um, you know, Fortune, you know, the Fortune 500, 1000, whatever, um, they, they tend to really like our stuff uh, because it, it kind of ticks all the boxes across the board. Whereas when you look at a lot of other solutions, it's like, if it's increasing productivity, it means there's less security. If there's more security, there's less productivity, et cetera, right? Um, but it's all honestly really thanks to like the decades of, and billions of dollars of work that Google and Apple and Mozilla put into, you know, making browser engines super fast and super secure. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's hard not to bet on web. Like all of this, I like, I hear about Wasm, it just makes me think that like all, it, what we've done so far might become the past one day because it just seems like a superior model. Like you you have, you compile it once to this one universal thing. It can run anywhere. It has better security. Like I, I, I'm very excited to see where Wasm and the web goes in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, me too. It, it seems, it seems like we're, you know, it seems like we're we're on this like kind of cutting edge of the a new era here that's happening. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think every every decade we've kind of seen a new one of these happening, you know, for the web. and and this one is definitely is definitely crazy interesting because it's I mean, it's, and and the other thing too is like what what um, you know what's going on with PWAs, uh, you know, where you can install these things as effectively desktop apps. And that stuff just continues to get better and better. Where I mean, I think realistically, I mean, you know, again, today you can do this with Stackless, where it, you know, it removes the URL bar, it looks like a desktop app, it's indistinguishable from like local VS Code or whatever. That's where we are today. Uh, I it just it, it seems to it, it seems to make a lot of sense that I think a lot of stuff is gonna is gonna start getting a lot of software is gonna start getting distributed that way, where it's just. It's just, it's a web app that, uh, you know, is being packaged and installable via your browser or whatever, you know, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it's extremely cool times. It's been fun to watch this over the past half decade or so, um, you know, from our side of the fence. And it's, you know, it's, it's fun to see it uh, hitting, hitting like maybe the early signs of like maturity. Um, this, this is going to be a crazy decade, I think for, for the web. It always like, I'm, I'm always a little bit amused to think back that like, this is what, Oracle was trying to do, I guess, with like Java and Javlets and, you know, like their vision for the JVM having the the kind of coverage that like Wasm has. And it's, it's really interesting to see. He's like, okay, that de definitely didn't work. There were similar ideas, but definitely different. Uh, and, you know, to see all we've learned and especially how we've learned, you know, as you rightly pointed out, like there's a lot of sandboxing knowledge that's been honed over the years of like doing browser development. And now I feel like Wasm is this like, you know, I don't know, it's it is this like really good target. And so I, I'm really I'm really fascinated about uh you know, programs that you compile them and you run them anywhere. So they're like running locally in your browser. And then it's like, oh, we got to do a lot of stuff now. We're just going like to push it up to the cloud, like very seamlessly. And you don't like see it. It's just like, it just happens or vice versa. It's like, 
you were going to run this thing in the cloud. It's like, oh no, this is fine to run in the browser. And it just like pushes it down to you like without you really thinking about it. You know, that, that model of sort of universal compute is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I often wonder what the world would look like if Steve Jobs didn't realize he could make money off an app store. Cause the, the vision of the iPhone one, I feel like we'd be in a better world if uh, we had stuck with that. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's interesting to see what's happening there too, where, you know, it, you know, it makes sense. It's been in their interest to, to not let other browsers ride on, on the app store and stuff. But, um, I mean, I think it was just like yesterday or the day before they, they, you know, it, it, I believe there's been a formal announcement that side loading is, has to be done in the EU. And then once that, that I, 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 I would suspect that that's once that genie is out of the bottle, it's just, it's, that's, you know, it, it's only a matter of time before that happens in the U S and everywhere else. Um, but that, I think it's, I think that's going to be, I think that's, it's going to be great for the web. I think it's gonna be really great for the web. We've worked a lot on making web container uh, work in Safari, um, which we actually got it working around this year. But I mean, even there, it's just like the, the there's just some strange decisions that, um, that, that are made on the Safari side. And it's just, it, it's very weird. I, I don't have a lot of direct insight, but like every release there's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, one step forward, one and a half or two steps backwards in some areas where like, there's just new things that are broke and it's just, it's, it's just this whack-a-mole thing. Um, and, uh, so I, I am personally excited to see, you know, Chromium and, uh, you know, Firefox, et cetera, on iOS devices. Cause it's, you know, I think it's, I think it's just going to, it's going to make, you know, it's going to make the, the power of the web, I think finally permeate a hit on phones, maybe a little bit more than it has for what you were mentioning, right. Where they've really been trying mm -hmm. to hold this thing back. It feels like the floodgates are about to open here. So, um, it only took what, you know, <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> <something>. <laughs> yeah. Just a few years. So yeah, you've, Y'all have done so much work and, you know, having Andrew and I both have been doing web development front end stuff for a while. So we've had the joy of watching a lot of these tools mature and like stack blitz, uh, stack blitz really feels like magic now. Like, I mean, it's really hard to, to state how crazy this sort of experience is and how much that y'all have been able to accomplish. So having done all of this stuff to get to this point, <laughs> What's next? <laughs> What's your next magic trick? <laughs> Where are y'all taking it from here? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of it, if you, I guess like where, where I think we'd see ourselves five years from now is, is um, I mean, similar to what Figma has done for design today, where it, it, it's, it just seems extremely kind of backwards that you would do design in some desktop tool that you can't share with the URL, right? Um, and I think when, when you think about web development, at a minimum web development. I mean, it seems kind of weird that you can't like use a web browser to build web applications today. Like you would kind of think that like, maybe that's, that's one of the first things you ought to be able to do inside of web browser. Right. And, um, and cause the benefits to that would be pretty immense. Like, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've talked about with like kind of full stack debugging, et cetera, but also the collaborative aspects where you can just send a link to someone and they're in this kind of live workspace. They'd be commenting on things, you know, making tweaks or seeing the, the changes live, et cetera. Um, so I think, I think for us, it's, it's, uh, you know, we've got some really interesting plans around how you can do collaboration, um, around web development in real time and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I, and, and some stuff where, I mean, it's very interesting too, what's going on with AI where you can have, it's like having an infinite number of, you know, developer partners that you can kind of kick work out to and kind of get these things back and which fits really well with, um, you know, the sort of like browser-based model that we're up to. So I think th those are the things that we're particularly interested in from a technology standpoint, certainly like web assembly, there's like lots of interesting stuff happening there with like more languages, et cetera. Um, so I think at a high level, it's those things. And then, you know, uh, more than ever, you know, it's, uh, a lot of companies are picking our stuff up. And so like, I think that's, you know, we've kind of gone from this R and D experiment in a sense, like, will this work question mark? It's, and it's like, yes, it does. Um, and now it's like going and helping, you know, uh, companies around the world build better app, uh, web applications faster. And, um, so that's, you know, I think that's, you know, a big thing is, uh, you know, our enterprise offering, you can like run behind your own firewall, et cetera. Um, and, uh, sorry, so I think that that's kind of a mosh, mosh posture, but I think the things that we're, we're pretty excited about and like what, what we're thinking about. 
Yeah, it sounds like you guys have built a good foundation, built a good base of support and are moving just more into teams and enterprise and that expansion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one, one question we like to ask uh, before we move on to tool tips is, uh, what is your spiciest dev take? I... <laughs> I, I think if I if I had one, I, like I, the, the the spiciest one I probably had for a while was like, you know, pr anyone that's not adopting Vite is probably I guess that's that's maybe still true. It's like anyone that's that has, is holding out on adopting Vite as like the bundler for their framework or whatever is has an extremely high likelihood of getting smoked over the over the next two three years. <laughs> and and I like that I would have said that two years ago. I I think it's worth and most most folks are using it today, but I that uh that might be a spicy take. I mean I, there's now actually a lot of just download numbers kind of backing that up. It's uh the advantages of that are, are pretty are pretty obvious at this point. So maybe it's less spicy than it would have been, but it's maybe it's still like a, a, a low to medium spice. Yeah, you guys are pr pretty uh, bullish on on Vite or Vite, right? You you host yeah. the Vite Comp. Yep. Yeah, and it was like back. Uh, I think it was like two years ago now when I when we first kind of ran across you, maybe a little over two years ago. But um, I mean, back then they were doing hundred thousand downloads a week. I mean, it was it was like it was pretty small. It was pretty niche. Like there is there's a little bit of a community, but I mean, it was it was. But we had a lot of conviction on like the design decision that they used. Um, you know, using like the role of plugin API. And I, I actually wrote a blog post about this on our site of when we became the biggest backer uh, in November of twenty one. But um, I mean, since then it's grown like 10,000%, right? So it's like, it's actually been, you know, one of these like calls um, that, uh, you know, ended up being really just, you know, we ended up being kind of dead on about, uh, you know, what we thought, would, you know, was really interesting and valuable about what V was doing. And uh, and the V community has been just fantastic. And so we brought on Matias, the, you know, one of the core maintainers and we run V comp every year. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool to see it grow and evolve and people building all these cool frameworks and tools around it. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it, we've been kind of part, we've been part of it, maybe not from the exact beginning of the journey, but like, but it was very nascent. It was, it was, it was a non-consensus bet at the time where, <laughs> that, that this, that this was going to be anything. Yeah, that's cool. I've used the tool myself and it is quite fast. It's hard to go back to other things, uh, re really push the whole industry to go, oh man, we need to make everything fast now. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I, I really love just the the framework convergence too. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things. The framework convergence, everybody moving to the same tooling is highly valuable. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like all of them working together, right? I think that was actually one of the, the, the there's like five reasons or something that we were that we wrote we were bullish on, and that was actually one of them, which is like it it, it encouraged all the framework authors to work together versus inventing all of their own things, which just hadn't been happening. And, and I think the, you know, it's kind of a flywheel effect. Once that starts happening, things are moving at such a fast rate. If you're continuing to just be off on your own, own island, you're, you're having to rewrite the world, basically. Um, a kind of an impossible challenge. Um, and that's like the flywheel effect is very much in full swing at this point. Um, so yeah, so that, that's why it's like, I, I think it's probably not, it's, it's not, uh, I don't have to be very brave, I guess, to say that, you know, it's <laughs> probably a good idea for folks to switch to beat at this point. But, um, you know, it's, I think there, there's, there's, you know, I, that's about as spicy as I've got, I think on me. <laughs> yeah. It was a nice lukewarm take. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay. And with that, let's move on to tool tips. My first tool tip of the week is a plugin for Webpack. <laughs> Oddly enough, a uh, gr great segue. Uh, so what this plugin is, is a replacement for HTML Webpack plugin that does one very key thing. So like in normal Webpack, it doesn't care about HTML. You have entries that are JavaScript and to get HTML, there's a plugin that does things to connect the things. And it's kind of hard to understand and just kind of magic in the end. What this plugin aims to do is be a lot more like a uh, Vite and have uh, enable you to define your entry points as HTML. So you can do the same kind of development workflow where you have like uh, maybe a multi-page app with like five different index HTMLs that all import different uh, JavaScript files. And what this plugin does is it helps you stitch those all together and create different outputs for each one. I literally was just trying to do this in Webpack today and I ended up configuring our Webpack to do this for us, but it's a lot more work and I have to know about chunk names and stuff. So if you want something like the Vite experience, but not you can't quite use Vite yet, I would uh, check out this plugin. It's called uh, 
HTML bundler webpack plugin. It's a terrible name for a plugin. It's very hard to find on Google, but it it, it looks like it has some cool features. So you are still using webpack? Yeah, we are still using webpack. Uh, we we got a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of different files yeah, we yeah. load, uh, a lot of different things we do with those files. I think we might move to RS pack, but uh, it's still a little bit early in that mm. project. And uh, I hit some hurdles when I tried to move us towards that. Were y'all using module federation in production? Um, no, I really want to just like for our electron application, like a big problem we have at Descript is we send a lot of updates and for people to update their electron app, they have to hit a button. So if we ship an update every day, they get annoyed by having to hit the button every day. So a nice thing we could do with module federation is just like ship a shell app. And then the actual app is a federated module that we just update in the background and they never know about. So I still want to do that, but I uh, haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. So uh, my tool tip today is it's more of a, a theme that I'm calling out. So uh, I think, you know, we've seen these, what I, I'm going to classify as like meta cloud services, things like Netlify, uh, things like Dino Deploy, um, who are building a lot of times building on pre-existing infrastructure and providing sort of like cloud services to, to do things. Um, and these are just two of many examples of Vercel probably would fall in this category. Something that's really interesting that I'm seeing now is they're leveraging, uh, their platforms to provide these sort of richer services like S3, like, you know, blob storage or KV stores or, you know, queuing service, you know, just all these things you can think of for AWS, but they're providing them in a way that's like, that feels pretty integrated and seamless in the platform. So I've, you know, picked, I picked the Dino queues as a tooltip in a previous episode. So Netlify just launched their blob store. And then just like the other day, uh, Steve Krauss from Valtown, who we've had on the past also mentioned like Valtown supporting Blob Store. But the 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 thing about all of these platforms is they're doing so in a way that it's like it just feels like an API call. You know, like like simple. Not you're not you don't have to set up a big library, it's just like import one thing, call a function. And it's and they're just leveraging, you know, the fact that they have a lot of more contextual information about the application you're running on their platform. Uh, which lets them skip a lot of like the configuration nuance and like dealing with a lot of infrastructural stuff. So I think this trend of richer cloud integrations with like smaller amounts of configuration is going to continue to grow. And the meta platforms that are building on the bigger cloud platform providers, this is one of their sort of like strategic advantages because they're a little bit more contextual in nature. I mean, the cloud providers can, can obviously leverage this same sort of thing too, but, um, I don't know. Interesting to see these two launch and I, I'm like pretty fascinated to watch the whole industry go in this, this direction. And I think in particular, I said it before, but I'm pretty, uh, bullish on Dino. Uh, and I think they're, they're having a really, really great approach where they're building these things, not only that they're like a native Dino, like standard library kind of thing, they're also doing it where you can host the infrastructure yourself. That's killer. So anyway, I love to see this trend. This is awesome. Anything that can make software easier to build, I think this is great. So this is cool. Yeah, I love the simple APIs. <clears throat> okay, now next up, a curse technology, Angular. Oh, <laughs> scroll this web page. Scroll it like just like this thing goes so hard. Like it is. It is. Um, I mean, it is pretty wild. Uh. I like I I I put a tweet about it because I was like, this is like the best designed homepage I've seen in a Google product in a very long time. Like, you know, it's like Angular.dev. Like that's 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 what it is. You know, um, they just did a phenomenal job on building this website. And um, anyway, so so they, yeah, they're actually using Web Container to power that part right there. I don't know if you're using like Safari or Firefox or something. I can't remember what the deal is with the latest Safari. They're doing something wacky. But anyways, um, in Chrome, it's actually really cool. I mean, they've, it's got the uh, you know running live dev server and stuff. And, and they, they took a cue from what Rich Harris did with learn.svelte.dev. But um, this is this is probably the the most beautiful doc site I think I've ever seen. Um, the way they laid it out is very cool with like interactive tutorials. So I just want to just point that out because it's, it's like kind of ridiculous um how how well done the, the that website is um but 
Anyway, so Ingo.dev. I think that's like the new homepage for Angular or whatever have you. I really need to check into what they've been doing. Angular feels like such a moat. It's like they have a lot of loyal developers, but they have like a, I don't know, a pretty dedicated community and they don't cross pollinate as much. So, so I feel like when I'm, you know, talking to people that do like Svelte or React or, you know, even like Quick and like a bunch of the new stuff, they're all kind of like in the same arena sometimes, but like Angular folks are just like over here, <laughs> like doing their thing, <laughs> shipping software. <laughs> 17 major versions deep. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's incredible. I mean, after the whole Angular just Angular 2 switch thing, they haven't had like really breaking changes in any of this stuff. As far as I'm aware, like it's, it's been a, you know, so a lot of enterprise companies use Angular, you know, for this reason, cause it's just consistent. Um, like they're very, very consistent. So um, yeah, it, it's super interesting, but I, I, it was, it was a cool one. And um, I think the, uh, uh, the other things I picked were VConf, which is like, I've actually been like playing through, you know, VConf was like 12 hours of talks. Um, and uh yeah, so it's like it's it's quite a gauntlet to sit through in one sitting, which I I was not able to do, <laughs> but I've been actually listening to all the all the talks now, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Like it's the uh, the replay is is uh, uh, pretty well done. Like I think up at the top there's like a link for it or whatever, but it's it, it's all broken out, and um, you know all the live examples are runnable within the site or whatever uh, from the talks. But, um, but yeah, so it was been been a lot of fun, kind of watching um, you know watching VeepConf. Uh, you know, and kind of rewinding what, uh, you know, what, what folks were saying there. My next tool tip is uh, next-video. It's a way to add video to your Next.js application. It's built on top of uh, the technologies that Mux puts out. So it does a lot of cool things like optimizing the video streaming. It supports like HLS and Quick and posters and all the different things that you'd want with a video th a service. Uh, the cool part about it, though, is that it's almost like a pages directory for your videos. So what they suggest that you do is you create a videos directory in your next project. You get ignore that and then like get LFS uh, the videos so that they don't make your repo bigger. And then uh, what they suggest you do is run this script that as you add videos to that, they upload those videos to the platform. So it's just like kind of, uh, it feels like you're managing it within your repo, but you really kind of aren't. It's like just integrating with their platform. So uh, if you're looking to integrate video with your with your app, uh, you might want to give this a try. I've been hearing a lot of good things about Mux and they seem to put out pretty good stuff. That's pretty cool. Video is non-trivial. It's not easy. So that's awesome. Next up we have image. On the note of videos and, and maybe photos, uh, Something that I've been talking to some friends about uh, recently is like, it's it's like hard to find a good photo and video like backup tool for, you know, like you're using in your phone. So it's like, if you're on Apple, you can use iCloud or, you know, you, if you're on an Android, you can use Google Photos or something, but maybe that's not what you want to do. Maybe you want to self-host something. Uh, so Image is just this project that I found on GitHub. Uh, which is, yeah, doing that. They're just like making a self-hosted photo and video backup tool. Uh, and it's it seems pretty cool. It's like looks pretty high quality, uh, open source. So, I mean, you can play with it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just like, I, I feel like definitely we push a lot of our data up to the cloud. And like, sometimes it's nice to have, you know, actual physical copies of these things. And and hopefully still have a good like user experience around it. And these have apps that come with them and they, the apps look pretty good too. So if you need a solution for that, check it out. Yeah, I run a similar thing on my NAS, I think. I don't use it very much, but it exists there. And last up, we have Remix. I don't know what's in the water over Shopify, but like they, they these guys are on fire. I mean, like they, they are like, this is, Remix is really, uh, it seems like it's really turning into like a very serious React framework. Um, I mean, Shopify is you know, apparently using it, right? Like, you know, they're, they're kind of switching all their stuff over to Remix. But, um, and they also just like, uh, you know, they've done this like kind of rewrite of, they have their own kind of custom compiler thing and they, they've, you know, they're, they're migrating over to V, which is pretty cool because it's, it makes adopting Remix something you do like very incrementally if you're on like React Router or something like that. And um, that's a pretty big deal because I mean, like we've got stuff at Stack that's on like React Router or whatever, and then we've lots of things over the years. Um, and so people that are on like create React app or on like Veed or like some you know custom Webpack plus React Router thing. I mean, this is going to be I think it's going to be like a pretty big deal. I mean, like a 
incremental path where you can just, you know, add it to your V config and you know, suddenly you've got SSR stuff, you know, um, they're doing a really good job. So I wanted to give a, a shout out there. So I've had a lot of fun playing around with Remix. Yeah, Sh- Shop- Shopify made a bet on uh, Ryan and Michael, and I don't think that was a a, a very risky bet. Uh, it's been cool to see what they've been able to do with like a company backing. Before, like uh, they were just kind of just some guys teaching React and like doing re- uh, nice React libraries in their side time. Now that it's their main focus, it's really exciting to see the progress that they've made. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think them going to Shopify with it, like ended up being. I mean, it, it appears it has been a very great decision. I mean, on both parties, um, cause having it be not tied to like having to be monetized or something like that. I mean, it's just really allowed them to focus on building something that's great, you know, and, um, that's great to use at any type of company and it's cool. So I'm excited to see where remix goes. I think, I think they're a pretty serious contender, um, at this point in my view for, uh, you know, if you're building react applications. So, um, I'm excited to play around more with, uh, the stuff Re- remix is putting out. Yeah, at Oxide, we have a bunch of Remix apps for all of our internal stuff and our public facing site. And then the like web UI on the Oxide racks is like a Remix like spa, but they're actually coming out with a single page app mode for Remix soon. So when they come out with that, we'll probably just switch over entirely. So really excited about that. That'd be cool. Wow. I didn't even know that. That's going to be, yeah, that's going to be a big deal. I think that'll be a game changer. Well, that's it for tool tips this week. Uh, it was a, r- a lot of fun having you on, Eric, talking about uh, your, your crazy pass at AOL and all the crazy stuff you guys are doing with Wasm and Web Containers today. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great chatting with you all. Yeah, so good to have you, Eric. Uh, and also, like, Stat Blitz is an absolute treasure. I mean, it's like, it's, I, I love anytime I go to the documentation page and I like see live examples that I can play with. So uh, appreciate all the work that you do. And yeah, just wish y'all luck. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. It's good stuff.